Well, it has been said that patience is a virtue. But if patience is a virtue, how come nobody wants it? Um, this isn't something that seems to be highly prized in our culture. We're definitely the culture of now. We have been uh, collectively become, you know, Veruca Salt. Uh, we want the works, the whole works, presents and prizes and sweets and surprises of all shapes and sizes, and now. Uh, in fact, patience is no longer even seen as a virtue, but rather a weakness. Uh, it often is viewed as some sort of lack of will or courage, or maybe you're just lost and don't know what, don't know what to do, and so it's looked at as some form of kind of weak inaction. You know, jobs want proactive go-getters that make things happen. You rarely see uh, in uh, the request that they queue up for, for the job post that they want, you know, mostly a passive, reactive type who may just wait and see where this problem leads before he does anything. Uh, you know, waiting is dumb, according to our culture. It's this unnecessary aspect of life that should be sought to be rid of wherever we can do so. Things should be, or so we're told, immediate. And that shows out very clearly in our technology. It shows out in our driving patterns, uh, in our venting, in our daily conversation. Uh, why wait, for instance, to hear the whole matter, to study it, to think reflectively on it, when you can just give your opinion right this second and post it for all the world to see? Uh, I mean, have you ever noticed how frustrated and how angry you get when things don't go quite as you planned them? And little things that just kind of mess up the flow of your day. I mean, that happens because our expecta expectation is that the world should go our way. Uh, that our plans really should be sovereign. If we've set out this particular to-do list and this is the vision we have for this particular day, anything that interrupts that obviously is a problem and should, you know, again, uh, deserves our angry response. And we prove that we feel that way by our absurd reactions when things don't fall out the way that we've decided they should go. Uh, and of course, this sort of speed and impatience and desire for life hacks are all fine and dandy until all of a sudden life is no longer hackable. You know, when all of a sudden you can't speed up the healing or the doctor says that it's inoperable. Uh, when you can't wish away that particular addiction or make that sin just sort of vanish. When you can't make that person want to forgive you when you can't know if that person will ever come back or if that special someone in your life whose heart has grown cold to you will ever warm to you again. Then we're left to wait. And we realize that waiting requires a strength that most of us just do not possess. And so where does one find it? Well, this morning as we look again at the fruit of the Spirit, we take up uh, this next fruit in the list that Paul has given us, the fruit of patience. And I want us to see first the God who waits. You see, part of the problem is we don't really understand what biblical patience is. Uh, and in one sense, the patience that we're, uh, that we're thinking of or that we normally associate with the word is much easier uh, than the Bible requires. And we're not even good at the easier one. Uh, and so it gets more complex as we go. But patience in Paul is a lot more than just the ability to sit in traffic and not lose your cool. Uh, we have lost, in one sense, the biblical associations with the word just because of our cultural usage. Um, the wooden uh, translation of this, if you were just to look at it etym etymologically, literally reads, someone that is long to anger. Long to anger. And so maybe you were raised on the King James Version, and that reminds you of what you, you heard about, you know, that, that, that the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, or that love suffers long. Uh, it has that connotation, it's trying to get at what this word means, but it's a word that Paul has lifted directly from the Old Testament. And that's why we get this strange kind of amalgamation of words, something that is long to anger. It's that, wor it's that word that is used throughout the Hebrew that we translate slow to anger. God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, repeated all throughout the Old Testament 
concerning the very character and nature of God and his own self-description. Notice the reference that Paul is using is concerning God's character trait uh, that we have translated patience. And so it does involve waiting, for sure. The waiting is a part of what biblical patience is, but you'll notice the waiting of God is not passive. Rather, God really is holding something back. He's holding back something that is justly deserved, all based on his own mercy. That is his patience. I mean, Peter puts it this way. Uh, God is not slow, as some consider slowness. Now, what's great about this verse is Peter does want us to know that God is slow. <laughs> uh, he says, God is slow. It's just not slow the way that you think about slowness. It's not the way that your mind works as a human being. Normally, we think of slowness, and it's like either they're passive or they lack energy or, or they just don't have a plan. He goes, that's not God's way of being slow. God is slow to anger, being patient toward you, the same word Paul's using here, being patient toward you so that all might come to repentance. So God's not slow the way that we're slow. He just doesn't want to do something or he's lazy. He says he's slow because he wants to show mercy. He doesn't act out justly. He doesn't bring his judgment because instead he wants to show mercy. So he's slow. He's patient concerning his anger for the sake of the mercy that he wants to give. He waits and he waits and he waits because he loves mercy. It's interesting, isn't it? One of the things that appears to us on this side of history, when we're dealing with the way that life comes to us and God's seeming in action about the way that things are in our life and in the world, it looks to us as a weakness in God. God, why don't you do something? How long, O oh Lord, we say with the psalmist, are you going to let things go on in this way? And while it looks to us to be a weakness, it's actually one of God's greatest strengths. It's not God's weakness that is the cause of his patience. It is his great might. He is so mighty that he can hold back his own judgment for the sake of mercy. And isn't that what the Bible says, that mercy somehow triumphs, wins in the battle over judgment? And it's the same God who's going to bring the judgment. I mean, consider the whole story of the world. The whole story of our existence as humanity is a story that puts on display the ridiculous patience of God. I mean, he creates a world and gives it to man. He gives existence to man, and then he gives the world to man. And he has this universal yes over all of creation. It's all yours. And there's one singular no. And we, like Baruch Assault, say, I want the world. I want the whole world. And I want it now. And so Adam defies his father. And yet, even there... This giving God comes and he promises salvation immediately. And as he calls a people to himself and redeems Israel from slavery, for 1,500 years he has to put up with her constant complaining and doubting and running around on him to the point where it's almost embarrassing. If we saw it on this side of things, if you had a friend who acted like this, you would never put up with it. I mean, what kind of man lets his wife be taken by other men, run around on him, and then say, you can come home, and I'll raise those children that you had with them too? I mean, we're much more prone to understand, you know, Othello's character in Shakespeare who mistakenly thinks his wife is unfaithful to him, and he chokes her to death in her sleep. We say, well, you know, it was a bad move, but I can relate to it. I could understand why you would be that angry. But we have no understanding for a God who would let a cheating wife be welcomed back home and raise her illegitimate children and do so happily. But when Nehemiah 
is summing up all of Israel's history. When he's looking back on what's happened through all of this time concerning exiles and returns, he says this, they refused to obey. They were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and they appointed a leader to return them back to their slavery in Egypt. But you, God, you're ready to forgive and gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, so you did not forsake them. It is so much a part of God's character to be slow to anger that if you understand it rightly, it's infuriating. And that's what happened to Jonah. You know, when Nineveh repents, he says, this is why I didn't want to come. I told you when we were way back there, when I was leaving home, that this is what would happen. It's why I went to Tarshish. It's why I tried to run away. Because I knew, I knew that you were gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And to be that patient takes power. It takes resolve. It's not something that's done passively. Notice it's not indifference. God cares. God cares about justice. He cares about righteousness. He wants holiness in your life and in the life of the world. It's not indifference. And it's not standardless. He knows what is right. And he wants what is right. But he intentionally holds back his just, pun just punishment. That's his patience. He is slow to express his anger in order that mercy might triumph over judgment. I've mentioned this film before, but I want to look at it for the uh, very specific point that we're talking about. Uh, but there's a film from 1994 called The War. It never won any great awards, but we owned it uh, early on in life when we were, you know, young and poor and bored. And so we watched it many times. So now you're stuck with illustrations from it. Uh, but it's a film where Elijah Wood is the son of Kevin Costner. Costner is a Vietnam veteran who's struggling to retain his footing after the war. Uh, he's battling his own mind, and in so doing, he's battling keeping a job and providing for his family. And as Costner and Elijah Wood are in an event together, Costner decides he's going to bring a treat home for his wife and for his daughter. And so he spends the little bundle of money that they have on something they can't really afford in order to bless these two women that he dearly loves. And he buys them each a cotton candy. And while he's off buying them, Elijah Wood has a run-in with some kids that have bullied him relentlessly throughout the film, and they proceed to beat him up. Costner finds his son bloody and dirty and fuming with anger. And as they're returning to their car, two of the kids who had just beaten up his son are seen sitting on the wall, and they begin to hurl insults at Costner, mocking his poverty and the fact that he can't keep a job. Insult to injury. And it's at this moment that Costner's character stiffens up and tells his son to get into the car. And he walks over with intention to these two bullies and he hands them each a cotton candy. The ones intended for mother and sister, too expensive to replace. And the two sheepishly take them without a word of thanks. I mean, what would you think? Well, Wood's uh, character is a lot like Jonah. <laughs> he says to his father, I hope you know that those are the two kids that just beat me up. To which Costner responds, I know who they are, son. And he says, well, if you know who they are, then why did you just give them mom and Lydia's cotton candy? To which he responds, because they look like they hadn't been given anything for a long time. And that line where he says, I know who they are, son, you'll notice Costner wasn't ignorant. He knew the score. He knew what would be just. And instead, he intentionally showed mercy. They looked like they hadn't been given anything in a long time. 
That is the biblical definition of patience, holding back what you know is deserved so that there's room to show mercy. And that is who God is. You see, when someone is wronged, obviously it causes hurt. And in justice, we want to return that hurt. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It evens the score. It's fair and it's right. And in some sense, in our natural state, we say it's good. It's good that things are always evened up and the score is kept. But patience becomes the keeper of hurt. You'll notice someone's always hurt. It's just a matter of who's going to get hurt in return. And patience says, I will bear the pain in order that mercy can be given in your direction. And of course, that is what happened on the cross. The patience of God cost him his own son. While we were still sinners, while justice was owed to us, Christ died for us. So Paul would ask us, how's your waiting game? And so he says to us, this is the fruit of the Spirit, the very character of God that is being produced in you. It is being produced in you. It will come to full fruition in your life. And one of the fruits of the Spirit that are being born in you is long-suffering or patience or being slow to anger. One Egyptian theologian put it this way, patience with others is love. Patience with yourself is hope. Patience with God is faith. And you do see those aspects all throughout the Old Testament. Notice patience with others is love. Because the reality is they will offend and hurt and cause harm and love suffers those things, in one sense, gladly, suffers long, in order that good might be given in return. Patience with yourself is hope. Why? Because you believe the promise of the gospel, that the resurrection really is going to bring about all the things that are lacking in you, the things that you can't see yet, and seem so far off and impossible, yet they will come. And this strange phrase here, patience with God, is faith. I mean, how many times do you wake up wondering what God is doing in your life? With no roadmap and no explanation, and God just holds before you two things. The cross of Jesus Christ is proof that he loves you. And he says, be patient. It will all come together in the end. All things are working together for good. And all of this, of course, is born for us and to us through the cross. How can us who are so forgiven not be ready to forgive? How are us that are so loved not love? How can we who have been so waited for by God not wait for others while they get their act together? How can a God who's been so generous through his own son, how can we who have been loved by God who's been so generous with his own son not trust the providence that he's put into our lives. Paul says, endure everything with patience, which has built into it the assumption that this life, this age, is going to require this particular attribute if you're going to live in it in a way that's glorifying to God. Your life won't be solved here. It's not going to be fixed here. This age isn't going to clean up for you. Everything's not going to turn out just the way that you planned it or your, uh, you know, your wish fulfillment isn't all going to come to pass, no matter how many times Oprah and others tell you it will. And so we will need patience. The famous prayer puts it this way, Guide me in all I do to remember that waiting is the answer to some of my prayers. And consider that, that we cry out to God time and time again, how long, O Lord? And sometimes God's answer is longer. You're going to have to wait 
and abide, if you will, put away that anger toward me and towards others. When God, though, how often it is that when God sends us a trial, instead of bearing up under it in patience, our impatience bursts out in an instant, and we immediately begin to question God with almost a sense of entitlement, like, how dare you do this to me? Or when people mistreat us, we so often, if we don't say it out loud, we at least say it to ourselves, I'm not going to stand to be treated this way. Not by you. Or when loved ones fail us, how many times are we going to have to put up with this when we've told you time and time again that we're not going to tolerate it? Or when the world doesn't go your way, when you don't get the breaks that you wanted or your plans fall through, how often do you think, you know, this isn't fair. I shouldn't have to endure this kind of stuff. And that makes total sense at one level. It makes sense to say to someone who's treating you wrong, I don't have to put up with this. It makes sense when your plans don't go right to say, you know what, this needs to be fixed. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. It makes sense to think when those who are closest to you fail that you shouldn't have to put up with it. I mean, how many years is the same thing going to transpire and still no change? But if you put those very words in God's mouth, see if you like the sound of them. That if he was to approach you and say, what is so right and true, how dare you treat me like this? Or how long are you going to act this way? I shouldn't have to put up with this after all I've done for you. And then look at the cross. And all of our silliness gets silenced. I mean, what kind of person could be forgiven a huge and insurmountable debt and then choke a friend for 10 bucks that's owed to him? Us. <laughs> that's the kind of person. But you know what? God is patient. He suffers long with fools. He is slow to anger. And if you were to look at your life, you would have to see it uh, as you swimming in an ocean of God's long suffering. I mean, how many times should God have acted out against you? How many times should He have given you what you deserve? How many times has He waited and waited and waited and still no change? This same God, the God of the cross, continues, even after we are saved, to suffer through our stubborn and stupid ways. I mean, even now, He loves us and He waits for us. Even though we constantly doubt His goodness, even though we murmur and complain at the slightest inconvenience, not to mention our attitude towards our actual sufferings, even though we forget Him, in the midst of blessing, and yet we blame him as soon as something doesn't go right. Even though we show the faintest signs that we're going to be long-suffering with others. Even with the cross of Christ casting its shadow over us, testifying that God has been shamelessly and lavishly good, we act like spoiled, petulant children. And yet God still bears with us, blesses us, extends mercy to us, so patient that he comes here even today, right now. So patient with you that he isn't too proud to send someone as weak as a preacher to carry his words of grace, to remind you again, even though you'll forget in a day or two, that you are forgiven. So strong that he isn't afraid to be shown forth in bread and wine so that you might taste and know that you're beloved. I mean, literally, here he comes again to those who have failed him. If someone treated you the way you treat God, or if someone forgot 
your kindness as quickly as you forget God's kindness. Think of your reaction. I mean, I shouldn't have to remind you all I've done for you. Uh, you know, how many times have we gone through this? And yet God is not ashamed to come and say week after week, do this as my memorial, as my remembrance. Remember me. Remember my promises to you. A God so strong that in patience he holds back his anger and humbles himself in word and sacrament so that you might know his mercy again. And every week we hear again, I'm never going to give up on you. The real you, the you that is known before God, the naked you, that alienating, offensive, hurtful, ugly, mean, shameful you. And with that outrageous grace given, out of the strength of God's patience, he invites us, he calls us into his life and says, you have permission to be patient with others, to be kind to those who don't get it, to extend mercy to those who have wronged you. Won't you dare to give it away freely? I mean, there are a million reasons not to show mercy. Good reasons. Reasons that are just and fair and right because they've misused you, they've mistreated you, and they're wrong. But God never allowed any of those reasons to get in the way of his pursuit of you. Mercy, through patience, triumphed over judgment. And now God allows you, born along by his spirit, covered in the blood of his son, to extend that same mercy to those who are in dire need. They're dying for it. And may we be those who are slow to anger in a world that's going to offer you many things to be angry about. May we have a different disposition than all that is heard on our news feed uh, and in conversation and in our culture in general. May we be slow to anger in order that the mercy of God might abound to those in need. Let's pray.